And I'll turn the time over to Matt, who's going, our speaker for today. He works at IM Flash. This is all the stuff I got from his LinkedIn. So it's like he can do a better job of introducing himself. But he works at IM Flash. If I understand correctly, this is a hobby project that you've done. Uh, and uh, everybody I know is super excited to hear about it. So what is all yours? Oh, that was <laughs> All right, so um, so just uh, I'll be talking about how I built a StarCraft bot uh, using reinforcement learning. Um, I actually have it up running here. Uh, if you want to play against it, I I don't mind if you do it while I talk or afterwards or whenever. Um, so I don't really love summary slides, but I wanted it here to remind myself to ask some important questions, kind of engage. Uh, the audience. So, uh, how many people here uh, are writing machine learning code or data scientists? Okay. Uh, how many uh, people uh, do any work in reinforcement learning? A lot less hands. All right. And uh, how many people uh, play StarCraft? Okay. <laughs> we got got a mixed audience. Uh, definitely going to have to talk a little bit about. Uh, what it is. Um, uh, but first, myself, kind of uh, why, uh, who I am. So again, I'm, I'm Matt Sharp. Uh, I graduated with a chemical engineering degree, uh, but I just do a lot more data science work now. Um, so I work for I Am Flash. We make uh, the best uh, three, we, we make the best memory in the world. Um, it's called 3D Crosspoint. It's wicked fast. Uh, Intel sells it now. Uh, it's definitely going to change the world. Um, I specifically work in the defect department uh, where I'm cleaning up wafer maps like in the top left and uh, defects like the toilet. Uh, that's, that's only about a micron in size. Uh, those are <laughs> pretty bad. Um, uh, I've, I've done some other reinforcement learning here. So here I've been uh, showing a beating Flappy Bird as well as a uh, Lunar Lander. Um, and uh, I've been playing StarCraft for a long time. It's probably one of my favorite games. And so that's why I kind of wanted to work on this bot to it. Uh, so up in the top right is, is a little bit of uh, StarCraft swag. And that's the best rank I ever got, uh, which was high in diamond. Um, all right, so uh, what is reinforcement learning? Uh, so reinforcement learning is, is really trying to model how um, we as humans or as animals learn. And, and that's through interacting with our environment. Uh, so when, when you think about a baby and how it's learning, it's often moving its arms, it's talking, you know, when it says mama and one woman gets all happy and surprised, it learns that's its mom. When it says mama to another woman and that woman doesn't react, it learns that, well, that's not its mom. And so a reinforcement learning is really trying to model that. Um, if you've heard of Pavlov's dog, uh, you know, he, he gave them treats after ringing a bell and they started to salivate when they got the treats. And eventually they learned that if they, if he rang the bell, that they would start salivating. And so this is all just trying to kind of model that. Um, and so it's, it's very basic. Uh, all reinforcement learning algorithms today kind of follow this, this model where you have some agent interacting with an environment. That environment can either have a detailed model or it can be a complete black box. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, what you need to know, what the agent needs to know, though, is uh, what actions it can make and kind of what the states it's going to get. Um, an environment is also going to feed back a reward system, so that way it can know whether or not the action it made was good or bad. Um, and when it gets that reward statement, it follows essentially this, this bottom line, which is pretty similar to a lot of machine learning algorithms uh, when you're training. It just, you got your... Uh, your old estimate, some, some learning rate, some alpha, uh, some delta between uh, the error or the loss, 
and then you're going to update the new estimate. Um, so on the right is kind of the notation used in reinforcement learning. Uh, VS is, is the state space um, and state value function. Uh, and so you're updating a state value function. So Q learning, it's, it's one of the first and uh, one of the more basic algorithms. Um, and so this is, this is essentially what you do. Uh, you, you go in and you create a table uh, that has all the different states and all the different actions you can make at all those different states. Uh, you then start running through it. Uh, you let the agent make an action uh, based off of whatever state it sees. It's going to then take the reward it gets back as well as the new state, and it's going to make an update to, to that state's value function, uh, <coughs> which is what Q stands for. Uh, it's a it's both a subject of both the state and the action that was being made. And you're just going to run that a bunch until you get an understanding. Um, so this is a, a very, very simple uh, problem uh, that kind of helps highlight it a little better. It's called treasure on the right. So, so this environment, there's just several different states. On the left is a wall, and on the far right is treasure. So all the agent can do is move left or right. Um, and uh, this kind of really shows kind of exactly what Q-learning is doing. Um, so what we're going to first do here, uh, if we follow our algorithm, is we're going to first you know, create a table that has all the different states and all the different actions. Uh, all those actions are just left and right. And the states is just how many rooms in this, uh, in this map uh, or maze that we want to make. Um, and so uh, then we're going to choose action. So uh, we're going to use epsilon greedy. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit late, later, but a small percentage, we're going to make a random choice just to kind of uh, explore. And then the last one is we're just going to go and take the action that has the best Q value in, in our table that we created. And so then uh, these functions on the right, they're just going to build our maze. Um, so uh, we're just, you know, different states here with the far one on the right being terminal with a reward of one. Every other state uh, tra transition is just going to have zero reward. Um, and then uh, the bottom function there is just saying if you, if the agent says move right, we're going to move it right. If it says move left, we're going to move it left. Unless it's at the end or it got the treasure. Uh, so, so the function on the right, that's just uh, just <coughs> writing out the pseudocode that we kind of already showed. Uh, so, but on here on the treasure on the right, what we see is the O is our agent. And on the far right, the T is the treasure. And you can see on the first iteration, this episode one, uh, it just, it, it's just random walking. It, it doesn't know anything about the environment until it gets down to the bottom uh, where it finally moves over and it makes that transition to T. And so that's when our first learning happens. Um, it, it gets a reward of one and it associates that moving right when it's in state four it is a good thing. Um, zero index, of course. And so, and so the next one we see, it keeps on doing that random walk and it's having to do it a lot. But once it makes it to the far right, it doesn't go left. It immediately goes to the treasure because it already knows that moving right is better. And so then on the third one, it's just making random movements until it makes it to the, to the second state. And then it knows that it's going to move right exactly. And then it's pretty much already figured it out. So on the fourth episode, it moves straight to the treasure. On the fifth episode, it, it did uh, <coughs> epsilon uh, exploration. Uh, but you can see from there, it's pretty much, it's always going to go straight to the treasure. And so, um, anyway, so I wanted to try something harder after I learned that. So uh, I went out and I started to try uh, different algorithms. But uh, as you can see, uh, kind of uh, with different libraries out there, uh, pretty much anything you, you want to do, you can solve in one line of code nowadays. Um, so, so with uh, Jim, uh, 
which is just a, a bunch of like Atari games and, and different reinforcement algorithms. They set up all the environment for you. Uh, I really like this uh, library called Stable Base Baselines. It has all the different algorithms there for you. And so literally all you have to do is say, hey, use this algorithm with this environment and train for a thousand or 10,000 times and all of a sudden you got a model that's doing really well. Um, and so that kind of, uh, for me, that kind of took away a lot of the fun of why I was doing this. Um, I definitely played around. I, I definitely beat some of my favorite Atari games. Uh, you saw Lunar Lander, Pac-Man, you know, Space Invaders, those things. Uh, a lot of fun kind of exploring the different models and, and how each one works better than the other in different situations. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to have fun. So that what kind of led me to StarCraft. So StarCraft is considered the grand challenge. Um, unlike, uh, Unlike chess or Go, uh, there's, it has a much larger state space, a much larger action space. Uh, it has um, things that are unknown uh, through a mechanic called fog of war. So it's not a complete information. You don't know everything that your opponent's doing. Your opponent doesn't know everything about what you're doing. And so you have to kind of scout and learn. And so, uh, um, so essentially, uh, for those who aren't aware, so it's, it's a real-time strategy game. Each player starts with a number of worker units. Uh, they go out, they gather some basic resources uh, to build units and, uh, and structures and create new technologies. And uh, so you try to create uh, an army to outwit your opponent. Um, and then, uh, uh, so, so it's, a, it's, it's kind of a fun game. Um, so to win, uh, a player really has to carefully balance the big picture management of their economy, which is known as macro, um, and as well as low level control of the units, which is known as micro. Um, and so uh, th does anyone have, have questions like kind of what StarCraft is? Okay. Um, so, so something that's interesting is that StarCraft, more than any other game I know, has just the highest talent curve out there. Um, so bronze, uh, so just getting an idea, so when people get started, they're, they're playing at a bronze level. This is kind of equivalent to what the medium AI is in the game. And that's kind of designed because, you know, you want to kind of be able to beat the game in, in single player and then kind of go out. Uh, the majority of players are in the silver and gold, um, and uh, an elite AI is at a kind of a gold ranking. Um, and to, to give you an understanding, so, so these medium AIs, elite AIs are built into the game. So these are just programmed if-else statements, you know, if this, do this, and it's just kind of based off of what the programmers thought of the game. Uh, in order to make the elite AI as good as it is in the game, uh, the programmers actually had to cheat. So the elite AI harvesters gather more minerals than, than, than the average player actually gathers. So that's how the elite uh, AI is able to perform as good as it does. Uh, so above that, uh, platinum and diamond uh, uh, is, is usually where I would play at. Um, and uh, uh, so here we, we do get some custom bots that are created by the community. Uh, one of my favorites is called Micro Machine, um, but this is kind of where kind of competitive play is. Uh, but even above this though um, is, is the top 2%, which are called Masters. Uh, so I've been able to watch Masters play and pretty much all of them can be uh, one v eight elite AIs, so uh, they can just dominate the elite AI. Um, above those, and in each region, they actually have what's called the Grand Masters, and that's just the top two hundred players. Um, and, and what's impressive, even above that, is, is what we have are, are the pros, and the pros in StarCraft are are just way above everyone else. Uh, I watch. Uh, exhibition matches between the pros and uh, and like two grandmasters, so they're one v twoing, and the pros are just 
destroying the grandmasters. And you got to remember, grandmasters are the top 200 players out of you know hundreds of thousands that log on. And so uh, just just really high skill cap. And so this this really helps uh, when you're creating a bot to kind of understand the, di the different distributions. Uh, so so my bot that I've been able to build it's somewhere in the middle, probably around the silver ranking. Um, so it's good, but not necessarily great. Um, so the StarCraft API, uh, the, so after DeepMind, uh, they beat, they created AlphaGo and they beat the world's best Go player. Uh, they, they decided to go and create this, uh, the grand challenge. And so they created this StarCraft API. They worked with uh, Blizzard to create it. Um, and, and from that, we have uh, kind of two different libraries. Uh, the one I'm using is Python SC2, and it, it, it's really condensed down in such a way that like, with only a few lines of code, you can go and build a bot. Uh, so this is kind of the most basic bot you can build, um, and it's just going to take your workers that you get at the very beginning and just go rush and try to destroy your opponent. Um, and it can usually win against an Indian AI. Um, so now that we have an API, so uh, if you remember, I wasn't having a whole lot of fun with what was out there in Jim. Uh, so this is kind of really the fun part of, of working on on StarCraft is that uh, you know we get to go out and uh, we get to create our state space, our action space, and our rewards. Uh, if you remember, it's I just need those three things, and I can I can create a reinforcement learning algorithm that can plug in any different algorithm into it and, and start making it happen. Um, so what I started with uh, in the state space, um, so at first I was just taking in and I was just feeding in uh, some very basic information like how many worker units I have, how much, how large is my army, how large is my opponent's army, how much minerals and, and other resources I have. So, so very, very basic. And, and with this, I was able to create, uh, just with Q learning, I was able to build a bot that was able to be a medium AI. Um, and so uh, I, I wanted to get a little bit more information. And so I, I created uh, kind of an image that has both, uh, you know, where my units are moving around, my opponents in gray down here, and kind of just giving a more information kind of where states are, how big the things are. Um, and then because I didn't want to lose some of this information above, I, I was kind of lazy and I just uh, threw bars down here that contain information like resources and army supply and things like that. Uh, if, if you look at what DeepMind has though, they have a library that has a ton more information. It has things like elevation, where the resources are, just uh, there's, uh, I think, 20 here of, of different levels, and so they just kind of stack that together and call that their state space. Um, and that's readily available to, if you want to go, and that's kind of where I'm going to be going next. Um, so the uh, kind of talking about the state space, though, um, uh, on, on the left here, Q learning, uh, what I Condensing that bar, I'm able to take that information and just call that my index here. And whenever I get a new information, I just add another row to my table. Um, but for but when I'm taking an image, that state space would just be way too large. Uh, there's just way too come too many combinations of of pixels if if I tried to do it that way. Uh, so really, in order to kind of condense. Uh, what, what you're going to use is deep learning. Uh, so a DQN is, is what it's called. Um, and so you're just taking a neural network and you're analyzing that image down and then you're able to take what your neural network outputs and you're going to be able to call that your state space. So you're able to take a, an image, condense it, uh, and kind of squeeze out the important information. Um, uh, one of the important things about, about this though is uh, uh, when you have Q learning, um, they've done a lot of math and they've shown that convergence is guaranteed. There's only so many states, and as long as you just run forever, you'll eventually re reach convergence. However, with a deep Q network, uh, the the problem is is that 
um, you're letting your neural network interpret information out of, out of your state from your image. And so the states you have are changing. So even though you might hit the same state, if your neural network's weights are changing, uh, your, your bot doesn't necessarily know that you've hit the same state. And so uh, this, this can cause a lot of problems of just kind of a dog chasing around its tail. And so, uh, and so this, is, this is actually one of the reasons why kind of reinforcement learning has kind of been held back for a long time. Um, but uh, we've, we've been able to come up with ways to kind of get a, around it. So one of the main ways and the ways I use is called using a double network. And so essentially what that is, is I, you, you create two, two neural nets, one that you're going to be training on and it's static throughout the game and the other that's going to be updating uh, the weights. And then, you know, every so, you know, 10,000 steps or every game, you're going to go and replace it. So that way, uh, one, you're able to kind of take the reinforcement learning part at one time and kind of the neural network model training at another time. And, uh, and, and that's able to really help uh, with the dog facing his tail, kind of breaking up that way. Uh, so next, uh, kind of the action space. So, so this is kind of fun um, because it's so big in uh, StarCraft, you know, do you model like every single button click or, you know, movements that a player might do? Um, so, so when I started, I, I first, I'm like, well, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm not sure if I can actually create a bot that'll learn. So I just, I told the bot everything to do, except, you know, whether or not to, how, how to attack. So, and, and I, I let it make different decisions. One, uh, just not attack, you know, build your army, uh, two defend and, uh, three and four were just different types of attack, uh, methods. Um, and so I was able to build a model with this uh, that was able to beat an elite AI. Um, and so I said, okay, let's take a step back. Let's, let's let it do everything. Um, and so it, it makes all the decisions on what to build, what units to create, when to attack, where to attack. Um, and it, it does all that. Uh, and so this is just kind of some example choices of, of the different actions I'm making. Um, so you can build a worker, so it's just going to check that your nexus exists because uh, you need that in order to build a worker. Um, and then if it does, it, it asks if first do you have enough resources to build it, and if you do, then, then build it. Um, so, so it's not very granular. Uh, there, there's definitely a lot that my bot will never be able to do because I, I created it in this way because its action space isn't as as great as, as what's there, but it was enough to get going. Um, so uh, the, uh, I did say I would talk about this a little bit later. So it, when you're when we're talking about actions, it's really important to consider uh, how are you gonna discover? How are you gonna explore? Um, if we look down here at this bottom right, we got this mouse and, and kind of this maze. And if, if the mouse moves up, left, or you know, in a diagonal, it's going to get a little bit of cheese. Uh, but it's never going to discover this giant cheese up in the top left, which is the optimal path. And so once it learns that there's cheese down here, if it always exploits that knowledge, it'll, it'll never be optimal. And so you have to build some way in order for the mouse to you know, not always exploit what it knows, but to try to go up and discover. So there's several different ways to do this. Uh, Epsilon Greedy is the most widely used, uh, not because it's the best as shown here, but because it's the easiest to implement. Um, Gradient Bandit is, is, is a really nice way. Uh, you're just kind of taking a gradient uh, of the different actions. Uh, so, so none of the actions are ever a, a zero. So there's always a possibility to choose other actions. Uh, and this is actually kind of what PPO or PPO2 is based off of our, our actor and critic methods. Um, and so uh, there's some good ways there. Uh, so lastly, kind of with the action space. Um, so, so what I'm using is a regular DQN. Uh, you know, it just calculates the Q function. I kind of already explained how it uh, breaks down, gives you kind of a model of your state. So you, you can also add what's called a dueling DQN, uh, which also in, implements 
and takes in information from your action space. Uh, and so it, it doesn't just calculate your, your Q value in itself, but it calculates your value and advantage functions. Um, and so your model can, can be affected uh, by your action space. Uh, so lastly, uh, rewards. Um, so if you read li literature, uh, pretty much all the white papers always say is you should do what's called sparse reward. So you should only ever reward your agent for doing what you told it to do. So in, in this case, win the game. Um, however, uh, if you look at most models, and this is one of the big problems with reinforcement learning, is you know my agent can go and explore a ton, but the only thing that ever gets learned, if you remember, uh, is, is that very last action when it sees the difference between the reward and what it, its expe expectations were. Uh, and so uh, a lot of reinforcement learning is learning backwards. And, and, and the problem with StarCraft is because it's so huge and it's so big that learning backwards can really slow you down. Um, and so one of the easiest ways to, uh, there's, there's a lot of methods to kind of combat this, but the easiest way is to just add rewards. Um, this is, uh, this is like adding some breadcrumbs uh, that, that your bot can kind of follow and it'll get it closer to doing what you want. Um, however, <laughs> that said, when you, when you add any rewards that aren't what you want it to do, your bot might not do what you really want it to do because it's going to learn things you, you didn't think about. And so here, here is uh, my naive approach of my first reward system. <laughs> Um, so when, whenever you destroy an enemy building, give it a, you know, a large chunk of reward. If you destroy an enemy unit, a smaller reward. If you, if a friendly unit dies, lose it. If, uh, if, if one of your building dies, then you're gonna lose a bigger reward. Um, so, uh, can anyone predict kind of what the problems are with this system? We'll just learn to go and destroy buildings and like hide around the edges, wait for them to build more buildings so it can destroy more buildings. Uh, close. You're a little bit more optimistic than what actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what it learned, so what it learned is that it really hated losing rewards. So what it decided to do is just group up. So all it's going to do, so it's not going to build any units. It's not going to build any buildings, uh, <laughs> any reward. It's eventually going to lose, but it's not as bad as if it was doing that. Um, it, it does build a little bit here, again, because of the epsilon greedy. It kind of forces some random choices in there. Uh, but yeah, it, it just it did not want to, <laughs> to lose any points. Yeah. Time for commands, kind of like if you tell it to build a building, it can do it within a second or so. But if you like attack an enemy unit, do you kind of give it like 30 seconds to do that before you give it its next command? Uh, or is no. Just accomplished or is it no. So, I mean, the reinforcement learning algorithm, it, it'll, it should figure out given enough training samples that, you know, even if the reward was delayed from when the action that received the reward happen, it, it should learn it. Um, and, and so you're just kind of basing that off of the, off the model. Um, but, uh, but no, so I mean, it's just making an action every time step is what it's doing. Uh, so I, I said, okay, let's fix that problem. Let's just get rid of negative rewards here. So, uh, however, this, this is still a problem. What do you think the main problem is here? It's going to take a long time for it to random walk into a reward. What? It's going to take a very long time for it to random walk into a reward in this state, in this state space of society. That's, that's true. <coughs> that, is, that is one of the problems. Um, any other ideas? It goes suicidal. Well, yeah. These enemy units to kill buildings? Uh, yeah, it might do that. So I didn't see anything encouraging it to build, although it does appear to be building. Uh, so you'll notice here, 
and we'll probably see it pretty soon. Are these the only rewards you have in the? At this time, this is, okay. this is the only rewards I had. Yeah. Overrated. If you actually win the game, you get a bajillion points. Uh, yeah, so I, I said it. So if you, yeah, so the main reward was winning. And if you won, I gave them 10,000 points. Okay. So that was still the main reward that they were going after. Um, but again, because it's, it's so few that it, that it takes a while. It's kind of like waiting for more units to come so we can go get more reward and turtling. Yeah, okay, so I think we're gonna see it here. Uh, so it's going out and what you'll see, so it goes in and it beat them up and then it runs away. <laughs> and then it'll do that multiple times, usually. See how it took out the secondary base and ran away. And the reason it did that is because it learned that if it took out the second base and ran, uh, the opponent's going to go and rebuild. <laughs> and so it's going to be able to get more points. <laughs> 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 and so it, it plays a really big cat and mouse. <laughs> it, it, toy, it toys with the opponent. It does something a little bit more human. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it does eventually win. Um, so I wasn't super concerned with this one because it was winning. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the problem with this is that it takes a lot longer for the game to, to finish. And so, and so that just kind of slows down the thing. So one of the things I noticed is uh, building pylons was a big issue for it. So pylons just give it resources. It just allows it to build more units. It doesn't really do anything. It's just kind of a resource sink. Um, and so one of the big problems I saw is that, uh, so, so I decided to build a reward in, so that way it would know, okay, this is when you wanna build a pylon when, you're, when, you, when you need to build more units and you don't have enough. Otherwise, don't build a pylon. So I kind of built this reward in here. Uh, however, there, uh, and, and kind of what you'll see here, um, is on the right is actually because it learned this it actually had by the time it wanted to expand it had so much resources to where it usually does it actually built two nexuses in the second base uh, so, it built, <laughs> so it built two bases just because it had so much more resources than it normally <laughs> did um, but there was a, there's a problem with my code and this one's a little bit harder to see uh, any ideas How is supply ratio calculated? Uh, so, uh, so supply ratio was just a, a number I, I gave it. Um, so it was like 0.2. So. Uh, what is adjusting the hyperparameter make it learn better? No? The learning rate or something? Uh, yeah, so I mean, if, if you... Uh, there is a learning rate. Uh, there's not a, a whole lot of hyperparameters in reinforcement learning, uh, at least with uh, DQN, which I was using. R really, it's just uh, there's the, the K factor and the learning rate, and, and those definitely do help uh, working with those and trying to fine tune them. Um, but they, they won't help as quickly as, for example, changing the reward. Because uh, it only, so this, uh, so, for example, building these pylons, uh, when I went from, so it went from having no idea how to build pylons at all to within six games, uh, it was able to figure out how to uh, optimize building pylons um, and, and much so. so. So you might see it here, it's already started. So what it did is it defeated its enemy, it kind of crippled it, and now it's only has like one unit that's actually attacking. And it said, oh, so, so it got to a point where, uh, so, so you can only have 200 units. And, and so there was this supply maximum that this ratio is in accounting for. And so once it got to that supply maximum, it said, well, if I don't build units, then I'm never gonna get into the supply ratio where it's ending. And so then it got to here, and now it's just building pylons like crazy. <laughs> and, and so this, and so, have you tried uh, a deeper layer? I mean, you add another convolutional layer. Uh, this, is a, this is a 
it's exploiting the reward function at this point. This is the problem yeah. with reward shaping. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is, adding a conclusion layer won't do anything. Does it get to a point in like in this where basically your your ultimate goal where it starts to catch up to the ultimate goal or not? I mean, yeah, so, so the reward here, it ended up being way too much because it could just build so many pylons within the time frame uh, that this actually, this game in itself became an outlier. Um, and, and so what, what you see here is I ended up fixing it and this ended up working really well is I gave it a much smaller reward, much smaller loss. Um, I, uh, so that way the reward doesn't counteract going for a long game because every time step I actually give it a negative one reward to try to push it to have faster games, uh, which, which helps. And then uh, the last thing I did is I added this supply cap. So if, if it has enough pylons to have 200 to meet that supply cap, then if you build more pylons, just give it a worse reward uh, no matter what. And so this, this really helped. Um, and, and from there, it was able to, to learn pretty quickly. I wonder what happens if you run for just a few more pylons in the case of like an attack. It'll, it'll take out pylons, right? Uh, it'll still do it. It'll, it'll just learn that you know it's not an optimal behavior. Uh, it, it just depends on the negative five reward isn't a big enough way to push it away from not building pylons. Just that it's not preferred. Uh, so uh, in training, uh, what you see uh, nowadays and. DeepMind did it with their bot is, is they do a lot of human training. Um, so they first train, uh, they gather the information that the human did, and then they first uh, kind of build their neural network off of the human training. And that helps a lot with that uh, dog chasing its tail problem. Uh, I, I didn't want to sit there and human train this. And uh, so I came up with my own method. Uh, I haven't seen any white papers that it, but I just built uh, what I call is a weighting training, uh, weighted training. So uh, I kind of came up with kind of a random model with different weights. Uh, and if I fine tune these different weights, I'm able to be different levels of bots. I can be an elite AI about 75% of the time uh, with different uh, trainings. And so uh, I then just let my weighted training play every other game in between. So that way my bot had something to kind of follow and train off of and learn from uh, that that wasn't necessarily human uh, so my bot overall has played about 2,000 games uh, this took about 1.5 months um, a, a game anywhere from 20 to 60 minutes usually sometimes much longer especially when the bot gets a lot closer to the playing level of, of your opponent um, and so overall this this ended up being about 580 game hours played or about 24 straight days. This was all condensed. Um, in, in reference, uh, Deep Minds trained for 200 years uh, <laughs> to get their model to beat a pro. Um, and it was a lot of models that were trained. Yeah, and, and they trained it in 14 days. So this is so. So anything I can say is if you're going to get into reinforcement learning, this is really a game of you know, who can have the most GPUs. In this approach, are you saying that you're, you're seeding the replay memory with human uh, experience? Uh, you're talking about the weighted training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I set those weights based off of my understanding of the game. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, for example, uh, worker weights here. So like I said, uh, for the most part, you want to build workers. It's good to build workers. However, if you have too many workers, then you might want to try to start to expand. And so, uh, and, and so that's just kind of my understanding of the game. And, and I was able to update those weights based off of that. Um, so here's some training data. Uh, so uh, average Q max and average loss. Uh, so average Q max is kind of the Q value that it's predicting it's going to be able to get. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is it took a thousand games until it started to predict that it was actually going to win. Um, so it so pretty much that first thousand games that was training the neural net model. It, it had no idea what it was doing, um, but once it got to that, it was able to start predicting, and that's where it's able to start learning. About uh, thirteen hundred games, fifteen hundred games, you can start to see that the average loss is starting to go down. 
And so that's when the model is finally starting to optimize itself and starting to come up with better strategies and improve. Um, uh, so, so this is the same data as the last one. It's just on the bottom axis is, is the training time. And so you can see here that uh, the time it took me to get that first uptake in average Qmax when I started to know what it was doing and I was able to start having joy as a parent. <laughs> um, <laughs> it took a whole two weeks. And, if, and I've been able to train like ImageNet models in like less than a week. So th this was a long time to start to see any improvement. Um, and that's just kind of one of the things you have to be ready for if you're going to start training these is because it can, it can take a long time. So even when you're playing against a bot, you're always, you're always playing in human time, right? Yeah. Uh, well, so I mean, it can, so the API can do real time or, or it can do faster than real time. Uh, however, generally, you know, I have a 1080, 1080X tie, a GPU that's running. Um, generally, just calculating and updating the weights and doing all that work. Uh, Real time is fast enough, basically, for that. Uh, real time is faster <laughs> when you're training. Uh, however, once you have a good model, then then you can get that going, and it can run faster. Um, you know, when it's just you know doing feed forward through your neural network. Um, and, and so yeah, so DeepMind they they have one GPU per game that it's playing, uh, and that's that's what they set. Um, and that's that's what I was doing. I only have my one computer, so obviously it takes me a lot longer. Oh wait, uh, so here, uh, so this this is just a total rewards versus steps. So you can kind of see that negative uh, line there. That's because you know every step I was given a negative reward. Uh, you can see uh, the other thing interesting here is. Up in, in the top right in the blue, average Q max is a lot higher for the wins versus the losses. Uh, so you know you can see it. I was learning something. Um, so this was just kind of a little fun. So I wanted to understand a little bit better what what my model was doing, what it was looking at. So I added. Uh, so I created a grad cam that runs off of this. Uh, it really makes a game go a really long time, calculating all of the gradients of every image. But uh, you can see here um, in, in the bottom left, it really highlights that all the time. So it's really learning off of those bars, and that seems to be the main thing it's looking at. Um, it, it's definitely looking, looking everywhere uh, at, at, different at different things that it thinks is interesting. Um, but uh, I think in my next model, I'll probably take those bars out to, uh, and just feed it straight into the model so that way it doesn't have to try to interpret it from, a, from an image. Um, anyways, I think it loses this game, so I'm just going to move forward. <laughs> uh, so DeepMind, uh, so just, just talk about them a little bit. So I've been working on my different models and, and bots I've been building uh, for, for a long time now, uh, maybe six months. Uh, in the middle of that, back in January, DeepMind released that they said, hey, we beat it, we beat a pro, which was amazing. Uh, if you remember back to how good pros are, uh, uh, they can uh, beat two grandmasters versus one. Um, and so this is kind of showing how, how they went. Uh, what you'll notice is they're doing a lot of the same stuff I'm doing, just a lot more deep and with a lot more computing power behind them. Uh, so they have this raw observations, which is those kind of 16 layer stack that I showed you earlier. Uh, they have a neural network, which they didn't talk a whole lot about. Um, this kind of makes you think there's only three layers. Uh, mine's a little bit deeper than that, so I don't think it's that. Um, here, uh, so in their neural network, uh, they have uh, an attention uh, switch. Um, which you can kind of go and, and read more about those. Those are pretty cool. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, this is just kind of, what it can do is, is a lot more, it's doing all the button clicks and mouse clicks and everything, but it's giving you an idea of kind of the different actions it's taking. 
um, which you can see even the actions it's allowed is a lot more than the 14, 15 that I let mine do. Um, so kind of the, the beautiful thing of what they did, uh, and I definitely learned from this, is they created what they call an alpha star league. And so what they did is uh, they first took their manual train, which was only about as good as my bot is now, uh, about the level of a, uh, you know, a little worse or maybe a little better than an elite bot. Um, and what they did is they, uh, they created several clones of it and uh, they froze the original and then they had them play against each other a bunch. And then after a while, they, they froze those and they took the best ones and they clones of them and they let them run several times and they kept on repeating that process until they had about 600 different uh, StarCraft players or bots and uh, here you can see their Nash uh, which is showing that each progression they slowly got better and better uh, Nash's uh, prediction of you know the different agents that they're able to beat against um, on, uh, on the right there you can see uh, just kind of the different modes. Uh, so they're kind of put into different categories based off of the units they build and kind of strategy based off of that. Um, and, and so uh, this, anyways, I thought this was cool. Um, just kind of creating more and more bots to play against each other. Um, one, of the, one of the things I notice is, is definitely uh, w w once you change an opponent, that really changes the game entirely. And so... Uh, just being able to have a wide range of different play styles is, is going to help your bots get so much better. Uh, so this is just kind of showing the MMR, which I kind of talked about. Uh, you can see uh, you can see where a Grandmaster MMR is a little over 5,000. You can see Mana, who's one of the best uh, Protoss players, is, is close to 6,500, 7,000. Uh, just kind of really showing that scale I've already kind of talked about. Uh, so they trained it for 14 days. Uh, again, that amounted to about 2,000 or 200 years. Um, so about 3,000 times more than what I trained mine for. Uh, anyways, are there any questions? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Do you do any self-play with your bot? Um, I mean, I have it here. I've definitely played against it. No, no, where you like pit, pit the bot against itself. Uh, you just play against AI, like the medium AI, hard AI. Yeah, no, I, I've only played against the AIs that's that's built into StarCraft. Um, just because my my bot isn't like it's it's not beating the elite AI. A lot, right? So I had, yeah. So I had opponents to play against. I, I think, yeah. If I got to that point where I needed to start stretching it, I, w I would, I was gonna, I would start doing that. Cool. You consider warming up the net using transfer? Um. Yeah. The the thing is, is the image I'm feeding into it is just so, so simple. Um, it's just that black and white image. Uh, I didn't. I think uh, transfer learning would have would have put a lot really. overweighted it and mm -hmm. have been useful. Anyways, all right. Thanks.